Tempered the storm, though your faith was small. I pray while you slept, and the night waged war. We stood in the fire, and we walked on sea, and we drank off the wine. It was made of me. Don't turn your eyes from.
Show me, come. Show me, come. I carry that. Well, good morning, morning. and happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Welcome live stream. Please draw your attention to tachurch.com for any announcements and upcoming things that is going on, but we are going to get into the time of worshiping our Savior this morning. Won't you stand for our call to worship? Matthew 28, verses 2 to 7 reminds us, there was a violent earthquake For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. Amen. 
He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. Praise God. Let's worship together. That's not where the story ends. Praise the Lord. What other cry do you have other than we sing hallelujah? We cry out, hallelujah, what a Savior. You are the Savior and you are my King, and I will declare it as loudly as I can. So won't you join me in tuning in? We sing hallelujah. 
Father, we welcome you to this place. We come and we cry to you, hallelujah. You are alive. Oh, my Father, thank you. Such a paltry phrase for such a huge gift. Father, we praise you and we thank you for saving our souls. I thank you for the blood price that you paid. You sent your one son to take on my sin. And I hadn't even been a thought yet. How humbling. Thank you, Father. Father, I praise you that you are before, you are within, and you are after, and you are still to come. We celebrate you today, and we rest in the hope that is secure because you are faithful, God. We love you, Lord.
the tomb where soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days his body there would not remain our god has robbed the And the word of God reminds us he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance of man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. What a God we serve. Amen. Won't you celebrate with us? You may be seated. The kids can be dismissed for Kids Church. morning. Happy Easter. Uh, this morning I'm going to be reading from uh, Matthew. I'm going to start in uh, 27, uh, verse 62, and I'll be reading into 28. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come, steal the body, and tell people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look for the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them, Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. I don't know that there's anything I can say that can add anything to uh, the awesomeness of that, uh, of that event. Uh, the one thing that that's, has always stood out to me uh, about that is when it talks about how uh, that the women were afraid, but then they were filled with great joy. And... 
Uh, that has always stood out to me because they were filled with joy uh, because there had been a lot of darkness in the days leading up to this moment where they were mourning, they were feeling a sense of loss, but at the news that Jesus was alive and active in their lives and in this world brought great joy. And I hope that that news brings the same joy and excitement to us, knowing that there's a lot of darkness in this world, there's a lot of tough times that we can face, but at the news that Jesus is alive, that he is risen, that there is victory to be had through that in our lives, should fill us with the same level of excitement and joy that they felt at the news that the tomb no longer held our Savior. So let's pray. Dear God, we love you so much. God, you are awesome. And uh, that is something that is not lost on us on a daily basis. So many blessings we see, uh, so many miracles that happen uh, in this world uh, by your hand, Father. And God, I just pray that in those moments that we face hard times, in those moments that we may feel alone, we may feel the heavy weight of life, uh, that uh, we will know that uh, we have victory in you. We have victory in what you did on the cross. We have victory in uh, your defeat of death. And we know that there is a glory coming, the likes of which we can't possibly understand or wrap our minds around while we're here uh, living on this earth. But God, we are so grateful for you. We are so joyful and we are so excited for the, the blessings, the work, uh, the victory that we have because of the life that you live and the life that you laid down for us. We love you and we offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good morning, everyone. Are we all on? All right. It's good to see everybody. He is risen. It's like the one time we do that chant back and forth, so we get a chance to do it. But it, what we celebrate today is the culmination, not of just the Christian faith, but all of history is, is bound up in the resurrection and on Good Friday and all that had happened. Problem is, as we read through Scripture, they didn't understand what was happening, especially on Good Friday and then Easter morning. They had no idea what was going on. So this morning, I want you to put your, yourself in the, in the uh, shoes of Mary and Peter and the disciples. I want you to stop for a minute. I want you to, to look at what is going on. Jesus was the promised Messiah. He was the one who was to come, who was going to usher in a new kingdom. Israel had been kind of pressed down and had been crushed, and God had promised that there was going to be a king who was going to reign, and Israel was going to be established as a kingdom, and, and there were going to be, it was going to be good for, for the Jews again. God was going to be their God, and they were going to be his people. That's what they were expecting. That's what they wanted when Jesus came. And you see, <clears throat> you see Peter, when, when Jesus is about to be arrested on, on that night, you see Peter, he pulls out his sword, and he's ready for battle. He's ready for this kingdom to come. And even if he has to die for it, he's dying for this king who is going to reign forevermore, who's going to usher in this new kingdom. The kingdom of God is here and so Peter takes his sword and he, he goes straight into the middle of the battle. As Jesus is being arrested, he goes in and he goes to try to take them out. Granted, he goes after the one guy who's probably holding all the coats and not carrying a sword. But you've got to give him credit. He's the only one swinging, right? So Peter goes in and he starts swinging and he cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Well, he's not a good shot either. So what happens next, though, he never expected. He expected Jesus to now lead this rebellion that was going to take over Rome. And Jesus doesn't. He bends down. He picks up the ear that had been cut off, puts it back on the man and heals him and walks away captive. If you're Peter, you're standing there. Jesus has turned to him and said, put that away. 
<clears throat> and all of his disciples head different directions. They run. Actually, Mark runs away naked. We see that later on. He runs away because they grabbed his cloak, and he's like, ah! And he goes taken off. And so we have Jesus standing there alone, and, and Peter and Mary come, and they try to watch the trial and, and all of the abuse that Jesus is about to take. They're watching him be whipped. They're watching him be mocked. They're watching him being spit on. This is their king. When is Jesus going to stand up? And when is this rebellion going to take place? They're all kind of huddling around and waiting for it. But it's getting worse and worse as the night goes on. And then Jesus is hung on the cross. And you have the, the people who come and they give him the wine vinegar and they say, okay, now, now wait, I think he's calling Elijah. Let's see what's going to happen next. The sky goes dark. The earth quakes. And Jesus dies. He dies on the cross. And they take his body and they put him in a tomb. How confusing that must have been for Peter. How hard that must have been for Mary. Their hope to be part of this kingdom, their hope for this, this kingdom that was to come is, is gone. Their king, the one who is going to lead them, the one who is going to provide for them, the one who is going to protect them, the one who is going to be their all, the one in whom they would find their identity, he's dead. He's gone. Mary still loved him. So she goes to the tomb that morning to take care of to take care of his body because it had been rushed. They weren't able to prepare his body on, on Good Friday. So she went there to put the spices and all of the things and to treat his body the way it should be because she loved him desperately. And early in the morning she gets there and the stone is rolled away. And his body's missing. They don't understand what's going on. They don't understand that Jesus has risen from the dead. That, that, that stone was rolled away not because somebody had taken him, but because he was alive again. That their, that their Savior had come. That their King was still alive. They didn't see that. They didn't know it. And listen to, to uh, how desperate Mary is. We're, turn into your Bibles at John 20, verse 11. This is the part where Mary is, is standing there and she runs into Jesus. She stayed at the tomb. When they first had gone, they went and, uh, and told the disciples. And the disciples came running, Peter and John. John outran Peter. John makes sure we know that. He's like, I was faster. I got there first. But Peter goes into the tomb and the body is gone. And Mary is just left standing by the tomb as the disciples head back to tell everybody that his body is gone, not knowing that he had risen from the dead. Verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize that it was him. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking it was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Do you hear the desperateness in Mary's voice? Do you hear the, the defeat that has been there? This is where everyone is going through. In a second, she, he, Jesus is going to say to her, Mary. And she's going to recognize who it is. But this is the first time Jesus is gone and, and there's a defeat to everyone. She says, my Lord has been taken, my, my King. This one who was supposed to lead us, it failed. What they didn't understand is what we know. What we know is that Jesus died on the cross to be our Savior. Not just to be a, a king here on earth, but to be our Savior. 
to die on the cross for your sins and my sins, that we might be able to have relationship with him. So here, turn in your Bibles over a couple pages to Luke. Luke 24. I love this part. This is where Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus with two of the disciples, and they don't recognize that it's Jesus. Listen to what they say. Now that same day, I'm in uh, verse 13 of Luke 24. Now that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked, they discussed things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you're walking along? They stood still, their faces sad and downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you, only, uh, are you the only one visiting from Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet. Listen to how they describe this. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all of the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we, we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And then he talks about that the body is gone and they, they don't know where he is. And then Jesus says this to them in verse 25. How foolish you are and how slow to believe that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. So he begins to explain to them what is going on. See, they only had half of the story. They only understood half of it. And I think they have a half that we don't. We have the half that they don't. They looked and they saw the king who was to come. We don't understand the idea of a king, do we? We don't have a king. In our world and in our culture, we are the ones who rule our own kingdom. We don't have somebody who is Lord of my life. For us to fathom, to think, hey, you know what? I'm going to give my life to somebody else and I'm going to follow them and they are going to be my king. They are going to be my Lord is so foreign to us that we will have a Lord over us. If I were to tell you that, we would rebel as a nation instantly, wouldn't we? That there is somebody coming who is going to come and, and be our king and Lord over us. No, no way. Look, they're making us wear masks. Come on, that's enough. How much worse can this get? You know, we have this mentality. You don't tell me what to do. I am my own man. I am a self-made man. That is our goal. Our goal is not dependence on somebody. Our goal is independence. So we don't understand what in the world they're talking about when they're talking about their Lord. Their king, their Lord, would be the one who gives them their identity, who, gives them, who makes them as a people have importance and a direction and where they're going to go. He would be the one that would protect them. He would be the one who would provide for them. They would have all of their needs cared for. They would have everything is wrapped up in this king. And they wanted it more than anything. Peter was willing to die for his king. They understood that. What they missed was what we understand because we have the advantage of looking back. We know that Jesus Christ, when he died, the curtain was torn in two. We talked about that on Good Friday over at Beacon for those of you who signed up in time to make it there because we didn't all make it. Even my family signed up too late, but it's all good. So his, the curtain was torn in two and our sins were forgiven. That curtain was a representation of our sin and our separation from God. And that curtain, when he died on the cross, was ripped in two and our sins were forgiven. They don't know this. 
They don't see it. Jesus is beginning to explain to them what is happening, that he's not just this earthly king. He's not just somebody who's come to usher this in, but he has also come to bring salvation to the world and that he must go back up into heaven and he will send the Holy Spirit to come and, and, and the forgiveness that he has offered us on the cross has brought us victory. We were just singing about it. And he's explaining it to them and their hearts are becoming more, and they're starting to get it and they understand and he says, this is what we've brought to you through the prophets. This is what all of these things were. And as he's walking on the road with these guys, he's explaining all that was going on. They were sad and they were, they were, they were defeated because they thought their king was still in the tomb. We're excited because we know our Savior is not. They didn't know that the Savior had to raise again. And why did Jesus have to raise again from the dead? We ever ask ourselves that? One, because we can't have a dead king. Your king who died, he's done, that's it. He's not reigning. We needed him as a king to come and to raise. But as a savior, it's more important that he rose from the dead for us because it was proof that God accepted his sacrifice. You see, if he was still in the tomb, we would have no idea if his sacrifice was good enough. And we would have no, we would have no resurrection for ourselves. If you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, man, I, we would be the people to be most pitied. If the dead aren't raised, then why are we living this way? We should try to be God and go out and make, you know, and, and just be merry. No. He says there's so much more going on because Jesus Christ raised from the dead. You know that that, was, that that sacrifice was accepted and your sins are forgiven. Your Savior is alive. The tomb is empty. Our problem is we live as if the tomb is still full. Don't we? In many different ways. We believe we don't believe, we, we live as if our Savior is still in the tomb. And so we walk around defeated and guilty, allowing our shame and our guilt to crush us. All of the things that we've done in the past that have been wrong and all of the things that we continue to struggle with, we have no victory over them because we live as if Christ, our Savior, is still in the tomb. Watch what happens at the very end of Luke. Jesus ascends into heaven. He spends, uh, he spends a, a, a few, a, a, like a month or so here, walking with them, talking with them, and he ascends into heaven. And this is where it's brought in. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Do you see the difference? Christ is gone still. He left. They watched him leave. What is the difference? The difference is their king is alive. The difference is their, their, their Messiah is alive. Their king is still on the throne. Now, we understand and we get the salvation part. We get that. We've looked at that. We've studied it. We've gone over it. You hear it every Sunday that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins to separate you as a sacrifice for your sins. He took your place. In a minute, we're going to do communion where Christ comes and he says, listen, I, this is my body broken for you, that your body may not be broken because of the penalty of your sin. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are separated from you as far as the east is from the west. You no longer are guilty. You can have relationship with God again. You can have eternal life. That is the Savior. We get that. But turn your Bibles over to Philippians 2. We need to understand much more what happened at that resurrection. Sherry started this verse but didn't finish it. It says, 
that we should have the same attitude as Christ Jesus who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. What that's saying is that even though he was God, he didn't, he didn't make it being God his goal. Humility. We do it the other way around. We're not God, but becoming God is our goal. Our goal is to be the most important person because we are the most important person to ourselves. That's not how it was supposed to be. And our mindset should be like Christ who humbled himself to become obedient even to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue will confess what? That Jesus Christ is Lord. We don't totally understand that, do we? Every time I read that, it was like, okay, Jesus Christ is Lord, he's Savior. No, no. What this verse is talking about is he's more than just your savior. He is your king, the reigning king who has, been, who has everything placed underneath him. All authority, all power. He, has, he is your king. He can do anything. He is all powerful. He cares for you. He knows you personally. You can trust him and he is king and that is is what has been risen from the dead. He has risen from the dead. Our king is alive. That's the good news. The good news is that both our savior and our king are alive. For most of us, we treat it as if God is our, just our savior, but he is not our Lord. They understood the Lord part. We understand the savior. But Jesus is both. And until we allow him to be both Lord and Savior of our life, until we allow him to be both King and Savior in our life, we don't know what it means that he is our Lord. We need to allow him to be our King. And like I said, it is so hard because our culture has everything revolved around us. And we struggle with that. This Easter, I pray that your eyes are open and things begin to change, that it wasn't just your Savior who was raised from the dead, but the Lord of your life, the one who has authority in your life. I'm going to tell you and ask you to do something that is completely out of our mind. Give the authority of Christ over your life. I don't know about that. That's hard. So is raising from the dead. He can handle it. He's not in the tomb. Your king is not in the tomb. He is alive, and we need to give him the authority that we have taken, and we need to give him authority in our lives to do what he must do. You are the Lord of my life. There may be some incredibly difficult things that are going on in your life, but how much of it is about you right now? those incredibly hard things that you're fighting your way through, how much have you made it about you? Versus God, you know what? You are the king. And if these things are going on in my life, I give you that authority, and I will follow you through even these hard times. And I'm going to trust you, because you are my king. And you are not dead. I can give you that authority, and you can change the circumstances that I'm in. You have full reign to change me. Do we? We do if your Lord has been risen from the dead. It says here, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some of you may be sitting there saying, I will never do that. You will. When he's standing in front of you, it just may be too late. You will admit that Jesus Christ is Lord, but some of you may say, he, he was Lord. 
He is the one who this is all about. It's not about me. And it'll be too late. But for the rest of us who know that Jesus Christ is Lord, it's going to be a day of celebration. It's going to be, look, I have, he has always been my Lord. He is the one who has reign and authority over my life. Jesus Christ is Lord. My knee bows now. I'm not going to wait until it's too late. I'm not going to wait until judgment to find out that the king is truly the king and I am not. So I am going to come before him and I'm going to and I'm going to say, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. And that Lord is no longer in the tomb. He is no longer missing. He is king and he reigns and he is reign over your life. Do you give that to him? Does he have that authority or do you keep Jesus stuffed in his tomb? I'll let you save me so that I can have eternal life. God, that is all yours because I can't control it anyway, so it's all yours. But my life, to be king over, that's mine. We shove him back into the tomb, and you say, no, stay dead. I got this. It's a little convicting when you put it that way, isn't it? I just heard myself. That's not good. But that's what we do when we don't make him Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ is Lord. Your sins are forgiven. Yes. You have victory. You are free. You no longer have to live in shame and guilt. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And if you believe it and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, then yes, you have eternal life. You have a father who has adopted you and made you his. That's what we celebrate. But you also have a king who wants to be Lord of your life. That king is risen. And he is risen indeed. That king is here today. Will you give him that authority? Will you look at him and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. This life, it's yours. That's what Easter is about. That's what we're going to celebrate in a minute as we do communion. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, Lord, we toss that word around so easily. Lord, and man, we don't understand a word of it. To give authority to somebody else. We don't even like to get pulled over. Father, will you, will you teach our hearts? The parts of our hearts that are hard, will you soften? The parts in our eyes that we can't see, will you open our eyes? Give us ears to hear your word, Lord, and that it may sink in, that we may know that you are our king. That we may submit to you. Even though that's what we fear more than anything in life. We can trust you because you're good. You love us. And you can do immeasurably more than we could ever hope or imagine. So Lord, forgive us for when we take the circumstances that we're in and we try to control everything instead of trusting you in them. Father, the areas of our lives that we don't give over to you as Lord, will you convict us? And will you take those? Be Lord of our life. I thank you that our King has risen from the dead. You're an amazing God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If I could have the elders come forward. What well, we get to celebrate today on Easter is communion. Now communion, if you're, if you're new to Trinity or you're new coming to a church, this may seem a little weird to you. Let me explain to you. One, it's going to be very weird because it's kind of completely self-sealed. So you have to do it correctly. There's two pieces. One is this super thin little piece you got to peel back first. That's the part that has the cracker that's on top. And then you peel the plastic part which is the juice. If you peel the juice first, you're probably going to get the little purple. All right? So that's how we're going to go through it. But communion seems incredibly confusing to people who've never been into a church. 
This is a meal that we have together. It's a very tiny meal. Fits in a little tiny cup. But when Jesus was, was at the Last Supper, he said to his disciples that were with him, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this and remember me. Remember what I have done. Our problem is we forget things all the time. We take for granted so much in our life. And God said, will you, will you do this and remember? And so we as a church do this together once a month. The first week of every month we get together and we do communion together. If you are part of the body of Christ, this is a celebration together that we, that we get to do together. If you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, and you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and maybe you're just fully understanding that today, and you're like, wow, he hasn't been Lord in a long time. You're welcome to give and to take one of these. And we'll do this all together. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass this out. We're going to have some music playing. Just take one, hold it, and then I'll explain to you what we do from there. But our God is an amazing God. And I want you, as we, as we come together at this table, know that our King has made a way for us to be forgiven and in relationship with Him through the breaking of His body and the pouring out of His blood. Our God is an amazing God.
our Savior knew he was going to be betrayed, knew that he had to die on the cross. No one else got it. He knew what he needed to do to set us free. Because of that, he told his disciples, this is my body, as he took, took the bread and broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Let's do this together. Also that night, Jesus was pouring out the wine. He said, this is my blood poured out for you. I think I say it every time we do communion. You don't pour something out by accident. You spill it. He didn't say this is my blood spilled for you. He knew what he had to go through. Because he loved you and he loved me. He said this is my blood poured out for you that you might be forgiven, that you might be washed clean, that you might have access to the Father, that you, you might be with me. This is my blood poured out for you. Let's do this together in remembrance of him. Our gracious heavenly Father, Lord, we stand in awe of how good you are. Our king and our God. Who has a king that would come and die for them? We do. Our mighty king. So mighty the grave could not hold him. So, Lord, I thank you. Thank you that we serve a risen king, a risen savior. Lord, who is now seated on the throne. Have your way in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please stand and join with me.
This king who is coming back again, does he have authority in your life? See, I think we lose a lot on that understanding of authority in our lives because we do not want God to tell us what to do. Even though he created this world, he said, this is how you should live. This is how life is supposed to be. We say, no, we'll have it our way. So we live in two different worlds. We live in a world where we allow him to be our savior, but we do not allow him to be king. We don't allow his authority in our lives. If you live in a life where he's only your savior and not allowed to have authority, you will feel empty. You will feel as if there's something missing. And that's because the king, the king who rose again, he wants authority over your world. He wants authority in your life. This is how you are to live. Our Father, Forgive us because we do live in two different worlds. We believe in a savior, but we don't believe in a king. Lord, will you reign in our lives? We give our lives to you. Savior who rose from the dead, the king who no longer occupies a tomb, but who occupies a throne. Will you reign in all of our hearts? Jesus, you're an amazing God. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and making a way that we might be forgiven. Thank you for making a way that you might be king over this world. Have your way in us today, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a great Easter. I will see you next week.